Good morning. It's always something special about uh, a group of little kids who don't really want to be up there singing, singing away in the manger at this time of the year. <laughs> very, very cute, but it always does make uh, this time of the year very special for us. So thank you to our children's choir. Thank you to Becky McCune for leading the children's choir. It's good to be in the house of the Lord with you on this third Sunday of Advent. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. Let's stand and join together in our call to worship for this morning. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope, my soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. There is no darkness with you, O Lord. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plenteous redemption. There is no darkness with you, O Lord. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. There is no darkness with you, O Lord. Our God is light. Please remain standing and turn your attention to our worship screen as we sing together, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Gracious Lord, as we prepare our hearts once again for the coming of Christmas, we ask, Lord, that your presence would be near to us and we would hold on to the promise that you have made to us, the promise that you are Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Help us to learn discipleship and devotion from those familiar biblical characters that we find at Christmas, as with the star that guided the wise men who were seeking the Christ child, may we too seek him once again and on bended knee, pre present ourselves in this holy act of worship. Help us to adore the child, the one who was sent to save us from our sins. Lord, open our minds and hearts to receive the truth that you would have for us today. Help us to receive your love, which is given to us and is demonstrated for us at Christmas time. And may each of us embrace that love anew. We ask these things through Jesus Christ, our incarnate, incarnate Lord, who lives and reigns with you now and forever. Amen. Since you're already sitting down, remain seated, but we're going to continue singing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Let's turn our attention to our worship screen. Christ is born, while shepherds kept their 
the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when lo. Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger, the humble Christ was born. And God sent us salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain over Jesus Christ is born. If Jesus comes to us again at Christmas this year, and if Jesus dwells within each of us, shouldn't that make a difference in who we are and how we live our lives? Hear these words from 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything and hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless in the at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. If we seek Jesus who is born in the manger, shouldn't we? Be at peace among ourselves, help the weak and poor, not repay evil for evil, but always do good for one another. In all circumstances, give thanks. As we light the third candle, let us remember that this is the will of God in Christ who comes to us. Thank you to the Walter family for being our Advent candle lighter and readers for the third week. And uh, most of you probably know this, but Ben operates our computer for us uh, quite often, and David is up in the booth running the TV ministry, so we're very, very appreciative of all the, the service that they provide for the church. So thank you to Ben and David for doing that. And David, I hope your foot heals. He can't even hear me. Oh, there he is. Hey. <laughs> Sports injury. Any announcements this morning? We do have the microphone ready. Just a note tonight at 7 p.m. we'll have the children's Christmas program, which uh, is always uh, a blessing and entertaining usually. Uh, are you looking forward to that, Becky? <laughs> Things will go as smoothly as you planned, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> well, tune in at 7 p.m. tonight and we'll find out. So. Also, next Sunday at 5 p.m., we will be having our candlelight service, uh, Carols by Candlelight, I guess we call that. It's just a time to hear the Christmas story, to light the candles, to sing all the Christmas hymns that we like to sing at this time of the year, and uh, uh, get back home to our families to celebrate with them. And uh, it's just a, it's really a, a peaceful thing, I think. And I always feel a little bit, uh, well, I think you guys get cheated, because that during the candlelight service, when all the candles are lit, I'm the only one that gets to see it. I'm standing out looking out at everybody, and it's just beautiful, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a pastor cam, so you guys can, no, I, I'd like to do that, but, <laughs> but it is a, uh, a special time of the year, so I would encourage you to join with us uh, next Sunday at 5 p.m. for our Carols by Candlelight service. Other announcements? Any prayer requests among us today?
I'd like us to pray for my sister, Jana. Um, my, she was the one that took care of my parents as they um, ended their lives and went through life. And she is um, having some medical issues that they can't quite figure out. And she's unable to walk safely, um, if bare weight at all. She's been in a rehab center since Thanksgiving weekend, um, and she's not getting any better. So if you would pray for her. And, for and her name was Janet? Jana. 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 Okay. We can certainly do that. Other prayer requests? Well, I know that many of you have heard that uh, Corey Didi has passed away. Uh, he's been on our prayer list for some time, and um, we basically seek the Lord's will. You know, we come to the Lord in prayer, not always knowing what that will is. Uh, but I know for the family, uh, it's, a, it's a hard thing, but it's also a, a bit of a blessing. And uh, they rejoice in Corey's faith. And the faith that we all share, knowing that when this life comes to an end, we have an eternal home with God. And that's the thing that gets us through our grief, no matter what that grief might be, is the hope that God gives to us. So let's keep our, our uh, prayers focused on the Didi family today and in the coming days. Any other prayer requests? Let's join together and let's seek the Lord's grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the worship services that take place this time of the year. There's something special about that with the decorations in church and the lights and the, the kids' programs. It's, it's just a reminder to us that this is not typical worship. This is worship that's designed to get our attention to focus on not only our souls, but on the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the gift of a Savior that you have given to us. Although every Sunday is a worship-filled Sunday, these Sundays remind us that we do have a Savior. His name is Jesus. His name is Emmanuel, which means God is with us always. And we need that reminder that God is with us always because this life can be challenging and difficult and painful. So we think about those people who are on our minds today, people who need the healing touch of our God. As Jackie has mentioned, we pray for Jana, her sister, and the difficulties that are going on in her life seem to be elusive, and the doctors can't figure out what exactly is causing the trouble, but we know that you are the great physician. And so we would ask, Lord, that you would give these doctors insight and wisdom that is beyond themselves, and that you would use them as healing instruments in your hand to provide healing for Jana. Father, we know that this time of the year is supposed to be filled with joy, but the reality is, is that it's not for many people, especially when we are thinking about those who are no longer with us and it can become a painful thing. So grief is often something that replaces joy. We also know that there are those right now who are mourning the loss of loved ones. In this community, Lord, especially, we have people that are on our hearts and on our minds. So, Father, we just ask that you could be present in a way that is unique, one that manifests your presence and your glory in a way that reminds those people who are hurting right now that you are God, you are eternal. And because of the gift that you have given to us, we go on living with you even when the worst happens. This life is not the end for us because of the gift of Jesus. And so we cling to that hope. And for those who are experiencing that sting of grief, we pray that you would remind them of that hope, that you would comfort them in only the way that you can. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We do thank you for this gift of the Savior that we celebrate at this time of the year. But help us, Lord, not to, not to only focus on that truth one time, one part of the year, but to carry that truth with us so that we become faithful disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, sharing his love, sharing his message of hope and grace and forgiveness to all who need to receive it. We ask for your blessing upon all the services that will be taking place in the next coming days. And we ask, Father, that we will be reminded of our mission the church is not just a place 
It is a people and a people with a calling. Help us to embrace that calling once again and to be disciples, not only in this community, but in this world, using all the gifts, all the talents that you have blessed us with and to do so boldly to proclaim the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We ask for your blessing as we serve you. And we ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, I would invite our ushers to come forward as we continue our worship with our receiving of tithes and offerings. Let's stand as we join together in singing the doxology. your children. Gracious Lord, we come ready to give to you the work of our hands, the work of our minds, the fruit of our labor. Grant to us hearts that are willing to give generously and sacrificially, and we ask that we would be blessed as we humbly offer these gifts to you for your kingdom. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Before we get to our next hymn, which is I Love You, Lord, my wife uh, reminded me of something that happened in, in our life that I wanted to share. And I was a little bit hesitant to do that because of some of the things that have been happening uh, with the lives of people here, some tragedies. But we actually had a, a bit of a Thanksgiving, and it's really a miracle. I have a cousin who lives up in Millette, South Dakota, and he had a beautiful little girl named Kaya who was five years old. She was run over by a school bus. And... Uh, what happened to her was nothing. She may have a hairline crack in her pelvis, but other than that, she's fine. Uh, and uh, so in the midst of difficult things, we also find times for Thanksgiving that we remember that God is indeed good all the time. And so I wanted to share that. Uh, my, wife, my wife reminded me to share that because we not only need to pray about things that are difficult, but we also thanks God, and I thank God for the things that are miracles, and miracles do happen. So with that in mind, I would invite you to turn your attention once again to our screen as we sing, I love you, Lord.
Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 19 through 28, which is found on page 1049 in your pew Bibles. John, chapter 1, verses 19 through 28. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then, are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but amongst you stands one who you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. This is the gospel of our Lord. If someone asked you the question, who are you, how would you respond? Well, we would probably first identify ourselves with our name. I'm Shane. I'm Bob. I'm Sally. Well, that answer is fine on a superficial level, but it doesn't answer the question of who we are. Our identities consist of more than our given names. So maybe we could go a little farther and add the names of our spouses. Well, I'm I'm Shane. I'm the husband of Heather. That makes me important. Again, that answer is fine, but it still doesn't go very far in answering the question of who we are. How many other men in the world are there right now named Shane, who is the husband of a wife named Heather? I don't know. Probably more than one, I would imagine. So maybe I could add my vocation. Well, I'm Shane, husband of Heather and pastor at Bethany Church. That narrows it down a little bit more goes a little farther in distinguishing me from anyone else in the world. And we could keep adding details about my life until there's a more complete picture of what makes me, me. And the same can be said for you. Your name, your spouse, your children, your career, your choice of hobbies. All those things and a list of all kinds of other things paint a, a picture of who you are. And at the end of our lives, all those things go into how other people are going to remember us. One of my duties as a pastor is to perform funerals. And in that role, I have to try and figure out who a person was by the life that they led. And I confess that sometimes that is very, very easy to do, and other times that is very, very difficult to do. Many years ago, I did a funeral for a man who had very little family and even fewer friends. In fact, no one really knew all that much about this guy, what he did, how he lived. I can tell you that it was very, very difficult trying to talk about a man's life when all that I knew about him was that he liked airplanes. How do you do a message at a funeral for a guy, the only thing you know about him is that he likes airplanes? Certainly there was more to his identity than that, more to what makes him, him. But that brings up an interesting question to ponder. How will people remember you? What will they say about your life and your identity? If someone asks you the question, who are you, how would you respond? Now, the reason we're thinking about the subject of our identity this morning is because that very question was posed to John the Baptist. Who are you? And it's interesting that if I say the name John, let's talk about John today. You have no idea what John I'm talking about. But as soon as I add the words, the Baptist, it immediately gives us the needed information to identify this particular biblical character and what he did, what he was known for. He was the John who baptized people. 
Why was this such an important identity mark in his life? Well, in fact, this was his only real mark on the world. That's all he did. He was the baptizer. And yet it's John's baptizing ministry that always finds its way into our Advent worship. Why? Advent is the time of the year that leads us to the celebration of the Savior's birth. John was just a baby when Jesus was born. In fact, he was probably about six months old when Jesus was born. And John's ministry takes place when both he and Jesus are 33 years old. So why, you may ask, does John's baptizing ministry play such a vital role in the season of Advent? What is the connection there? And I think the answer is found primarily in the meaning of the word Advent. And I do this every single year, so this is your yearly reminder that the word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming. And since Christmas deals directly with Jesus' first coming as the Savior, it also reminds us that Jesus will come again. This time not as Savior, but something else. And if Jesus is going to come again, then we need to be prepared for that coming, which is why John's ministry is vital to the season of Advent. His ministry is one of preparation. And so we ask, are we prepared for that moment when the Savior breaks into our history once again, breaks into our world once again? And if not, John's message is one that we need to hear so that we can examine our own lives in order to be prepared for that moment. And of course, John's ministry of preparation is centered around the subject of repentance, our favorite, favorite word, everybody's favorite word, really, repentance. But along with his ministry of preparation, John also teaches us about our own relationship with the Savior. In the words of author and theologian Robert Weber, John the Baptist represents the relationship that we must, too, have with Jesus. His goal in life was to point to Jesus and Jesus alone. So in terms of understanding how our own identities, how does Jesus fit with defining who you are? How does your life point to Jesus like John's does? John the Baptist is most famous for shouting the words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Everybody knows he said that. But right behind that, there's another saying that John is famous for, which are these words, he must increase and I must decrease. How much of Jesus can people see in our lives? Are we still right there? Have we increased while Jesus decreased? Or have we follow John's example? We decrease and we increase his presence in our lives. How much of Jesus defines your own identity? Well, John has a great deal to demonstrate for us in that regard. And this section of John's gospel begins with John the Baptist providing an answer to that basic yet challenging question, who are you? John's identity is rooted in the calling that God had given to him. It had been roughly 400 years since the last prophet of God had spoken, and much had happened during that time, and now Israel was a conquered people living under the authority of the mighty Roman Empire. And during that time, there was this feeling of, I guess we could call it expectation, that God was up to something, although people didn't really quite know what. In the back of people's minds, there was what we might call the messianic expectation, that God's chosen would finally be revealed and usher in something that would dramatically change the fortunes of Israel. And it's in that into that expectant environment that John the Baptist shows up onto the scene. Of course, if God was indeed up to something, then the arrival of a wild man baptizing people in the Jordan River would have been something that the religious elite would have very much wanted to know about. So we read, and this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? We want to know who you are. And the way that I interpret this is that those in the upper echelons of religious life wanted to know if John was somebody that they need to be associated with, they should be involved with, or whether John was just some crazy person causing a ruckus. I think this demonstrates the kind of prideful arrogance on the part of these religious leaders of God, because if something 
is going on that involves God, then they want to be involved in it too. They should be at the, at the, at the head of it. So they want to know, who's this guy? But they don't bother going out to see what John is up to for themselves. Instead, they send some of the lesser servants for the job. Those that were sent consisted of priests and Levites. These were those who assisted in the rituals and the rites involved in temple worship. But what we often forget is that John's father, Zechariah, was also a priest who served at the temple. And according to Luke's gospel, John's mother, Elizabeth, was a descendant of Aaron, who was the very first high priest. He was a Levite as well, but he was the first high priest, and therefore you can be a Levite and be a part of that priestly order, but you can, you can never be a high priest unless you're a direct descendant of Aaron and his family. Now, whether or not this emissary from Jerusalem knew John's lineage or not is really beside the point. They were sent with one mission and one mission only. They want to find out who this guy is. And so they come to the banks of the Jordan River and they ask him point blank, who are you? In other words, are you somebody of importance or not? And what makes John's response interesting is that he, he answers the question by confessing what he is not. No doubt John knew the current environment of messianic expectation, and he probably knew why this emissary was sent by this religious elite in Jerusalem. So the first thing that he does was to confess in no uncertain terms that he was not who they thought he was. I am not the coming one. He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. The author of this gospel uses the word confess twice, which uh, really indicates that John made it very, 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 very clear, I am not the Messiah. And notice that this emissary did not even ask him that question, but John knew what they wanted. Who are you? I am not the Savior. Now, I'm fairly positive that you and I will never be mistaken for the Messiah of God. I think that's probably a safe assumption. This was a unique situation that John the Baptist faced. But what John does teach us here is that if we are doing something for God or being used by God for some specific purpose, it is that purpose or that mission that needs to be the thing that shines through us clearly, always. John was not out there in the desert trying to gain a following or to become known as some great religious figure. God had called them to a specific purpose, and that purpose was what was driving John to perform those baptisms in the river. John was not sent to be the Savior. He was sent to prepare the people for the Savior. He made sure that there was absolutely no confusion about that fact. I've often heard about people who have lost their way, so to speak, which usually means that what they started out doing had be, has become something else that they no longer recognize, even something that, you know, whether it's a ministry, whether it's their own personal passion or calling, they might have started out great, but somewhere along the lines they got off track and now they don't even recognize that mission, that ministry, they don't even recognize themselves. Unfortunately, there's lots of stories of pastors who started out with the sole purpose of, of serving God, doing God's work, only to fall victim to the trap of fame and wealth and, you know, my church is bigger than yours and all that kind of stuff. Their identities have become confused and their mission goes off track. I think one of the greatest temptations of the devil is to get us to think that it's all about us. No, it is not. In service to God, it is never about us. And John entertains no such temptations whatsoever. He is called by God for a specific purpose, and his identity is tied to fulfilling that purpose. Now, I have no idea how many people had come out to, to John for baptism. But from Matthew's gospel, we read, People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region around the Jordan. Sounds like a lot of people, I think. He was drawing large crowds, enough to draw the attention of this Jerusalem elite. And John could have said to himself, wow, look at me. Look what I'm doing. Look how many people I've baptized. Or look how important I am. But John ministered with an unshakable resolve. He knew who he was, or perhaps more importantly, he knew who he was not. Who are you, the emissary asks. I am not the Christ. Get that out of your mind. 
There was no confusion in the least about who John understood himself to be. He is a servant of God, and he is doing the work of God. And I think a very important aspect of what John teaches us is that our identities are not based on what other people expect of us or even expectations that other people put on us. Our identities are rooted in who God has called us to be and living our lives in obedience to that calling. That is who we are. Living according to that divine calling allowed, allowed John to be confidently and boldly engaged in the work of God. What was the work and the calling that God had placed on his life? Well, that brings us to our next point. John understood his calling to be that of preparation. If John is not the Christ, as he so adamantly has made known, then there must be a reason for what he's doing out here. Why are you out here? According to the thought process of this delegation, he must, uh, it must be some other important figure then. Otherwise, what is the whole reason he's out here doing this? And so they ask him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? Now, along with the Messiah, there were also some other people that uh, the culture would have been expecting for end times kinds of events. One of those end times figures that they were expecting was the prophet Elijah. Why did the people think that Elijah would show up during the end times? Well, for a couple of reasons. The first reason is because Elijah never died. The Lord took him in a fiery chariot, presumably to be used by the Lord for some moment in the future. And the second reason is because of something found in Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi says, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of their children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. What then? Are you Elijah? The people ask. I am not. All right, he's not. Okay, okay, he's not the Messiah, he's not Elijah. So they ask another question, are you the prophet then? Ha, that's it. And the notion of the prophet comes all the way back uh, from the book of Deuteronomy. This is what the Lord says in Deuteronomy. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses, from among them, among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So since that time, the people have been looking for that prophet who is like Moses to speak the words of God. Are you the prophet then? No, I'm not, John says. All right, well. He's not the Christ. He's, he's not Elijah. He's not the prophet. What are we going to do here? He's not any of these things that we thought he might be, and yet he's out baptizing people. So they said to him, well, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And the way in which John responds to their question emphasizes his understanding of himself as well as his reason for doing the things that he's doing. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. John's answer is basically telling them if they wish to situate him within the context of God's divine and end times plan, then you can find him in the words of the prophet Isaiah. The original context of this saying from Isaiah involved leveling a path through the desert so that God could lead his people home from the Babylonian exile. It's a picture of God's gracious deliverance, his mercy. But the full extent of that prophecy is in Isaiah goes all the way forward and looks to that event in some time in the future when God will create a, another deliverance. And, and that involved in that is a new heaven and a new earth. It is that path, in fact, that John is preparing. That is the way that he is making straight. And that is how John sees himself and his mission that God has given to him. He is the preparer. God has called him to get the people ready for something that God is going to be doing. Another deliverance. And John is single-minded in that calling that God has placed on his life. He understood his mission as one of preparation. And it was a very, very important ministry of preparation. That brings us to a third element in this dialogue, and that John's baptism is one that corresponds with his mission. The gospel writer tells us that there were some Pharisees 
who were among this delegation from Jerusalem. And of course, Pharisees were all about keeping the rules. They're all about legalism and doing things according to the law. And verse 25 says, they asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? In other words, if you're not any of these important end times figures, then what, the, what is the point of these baptisms that you're doing out here? Now, baptism is not something that's only found in the New Testament. In fact, baptism was practiced in Old Testament times as well. Usually when a convert would convert to Judaism, a Gentile would convert to Judaism. The convert would undergo a ritual cleansing to, to signify that they had been washed, they had been cleansed, and they are now part of God's covenant people. According to the historians that I read, this, this is a proselyte bat, baptism, as it was called. It was actually performed by the converts themselves. That is, it was self-administered, a self-administered baptism. You go in the water and you come out of the water. There was nobody else involved. So here is an oddity where John is baptizing people. He's the one that people are coming to, and he's the one that's administering this baptism, and that was an odd thing. And so the Pharisees say, why are you doing that? They're curious. But further, it is very likely that the act of baptism itself was connected with a kind of end times expectation. We get this from passages like Ezekiel 36, where God declares that in the time of restoration... I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. This is referring to a kind of washing, a kind of baptism. Well, John has already denied being one of these expected end times figures, so why is he baptizing people? There's another aspect of the Pharisee's question that lies just underneath the surface. And the question has to do with authority. But what, by what authority are you doing these things? Of course, the underlying charge is that we didn't give you the authority to do these things, nor did the people who sent us give you the authority to do these things. We might even pose the question this way. Who do you think you are doing these things? And John's answer is one that we need to take to heart. He's not interested in providing some sort of justification for what he's doing. He's not interested in that at all. Instead, the only thing that John does here is to point to his mission, which is one of preparation, specifically a preparation for Jesus. I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Now, to get the impact of this statement, we have to understand the biblical world of the first century. Uncomfortable as it might seem, it was a world where slavery was very, very common. It was the it was a pivotal in that society. It was all over the place. And in that culture, the master could order the slave to do just about anything, lots of things, lots of degrading things even, except there were some things that were even too low for the master to order the slave to do. And one of those things was removing the shoes of their master. That was even too low for a slave to do. And what does John say here? I'm preparing the way for one whose sandals I am not even worthy to untie. He's preparing for that one. Well, who is that one that John is referring to? It is the one that they do not know, he says. Somebody among you that you don't know. It is the Messiah that they've been waiting for. That's true. But you see, they are not ready to know him. And they are not ready to receive him. They are not ready to meet their Savior. And that is why John is so important. And that is why John's baptism is so important. By what authority is John doing these things? And the answer is by God's authority. It's God's mission. John is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy of one crying in the wilderness and making a straight path for the coming of the Lord. The means of preparing the people for John is by a baptism of repentance. That's how he prepares the people. A baptism that clears the path into the human heart that is riddled with sin and disobedience so that the Savior might have a straight way to make inroads with the people. 
That is how John sees himself, a lowly servant of the Messiah who is not even worthy enough to untie his sandals, whose baptism of repentance prepares the hearts of the people to meet the Savior. And if the people are not willing to submit to John's baptism of repentance, then the Savior's path to the human heart, there's lots of roadblocks there. It remains filled with debris. How many people in the world today have literal roadblocks in their life that are keeping their hearts from receiving the Savior? You shall not pass. <laughs> the message of repentance is a constant theme found throughout Scripture, so John's message is not a new one. What is new is his baptism. I baptize in water, John says, much like the Gentiles who would be baptized in order to become part of God's covenant people, this baptism of repentance carries the significance of preparing the people to become part of God's new covenant people. The people who must turn to the coming Savior in faith in order to receive his gift of salvation. John was preparing the people to receive the gift of salvation that God had sent, and the people were not ready to receive that gift until they had submitted to John's mission and his calling of repentance. And so we can say that John's baptism is one that very much corresponds with the mission that God had given to him. Who are you? The delegation of the religious elite asked John. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness who is making a straight way for the Lord, John says. He was a servant of God. That was his identity, and the way he lived his life reflected that identity. You and I are not John the Baptist, and yet John has given us an example to follow. If someone asked us the question, who are you, would our first thought be to answer according to our relationship with God? Would we do that? Or would there be a whole litany of other things that we would list before ever even considering our relationship with God that forms our identity? It's true that the details of our lives consist of things like who we married, what careers we have chosen, our hobbies, the things that we do, other things that we enjoy. All those things make up little pieces of who we are. We can learn about a person by knowing information like that. But those things do not define us. What John has demonstrated for us is that his identity as a servant of God informs everything else about him, everything else about his life. The same should be true for us. Our identities as redeemed children of God should inform everything else that we do in our lives. The choices that we make, our spouses, to our careers, to our hobbies, the way we speak, the friends that we have, should inform everything else about us. And as a pastor, I can tell you when we, when we have a person like that and we're celebrating their life, you can follow that path all the way up to their faith in God. And it's a much blessed thing to do, to talk about a person's life in that regard. It's much easier than to, to try to find a person who has lived like the devil, basically, and yet trying to paint them into heaven. It's really, really difficult to try and do that. And so I don't. How do we live our lives? Can people see Jesus in us? Does your relationship with God define what people can learn about you? If not, then John's message is one that we need to hear again. In fact, John's message is one that we need to heed again. If our identities are shaped by our relationship with God, then we are prepared for that moment, whenever that might be, when Jesus comes again in glory. But if we are not ready... Heeding John's cry for repentance clears the way, removes those roadblocks for the Savior to enter in our lives and once again. And so our question for this morning is simply this, are you prepared to receive God's gift of a Savior? Are you prepared to receive God's gift of a Savior? Are you ready for the coming one? That's a question that only you can answer. May John be our guide as we look for and prepare for, once again, the coming of our Lord and our Savior. Let us be prepared. Let's pray together. 
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the testimony given to us by John, who is the Baptist. We thank you for his obedience. We thank you for his faithfulness to the calling you placed on his life. And it's an important calling, one that still speaks to us today. So often at this time of the year, we, we simply go through the motions, we put up the decorations, we buy the presents, we attend the, the different functions that happen during the Christmas season, and we forget that the reason we celebrate Christmas is because you have given a Savior. Even if we've been people of faith for 50 or 60 years, we need to clear the path once again. We need to heed John's message of repentance so that we can receive the Savior anew in our hearts and for those who have never done it, perhaps for the first time. Help us not to ignore John's message, but help us to recognize our own sin and to come before you in confession and humility, asking for your forgiveness so that Jesus might truly find a place in our hearts. We thank you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus we ask these things. Amen. I would invite you once again to stand and turn your attention to our worship screen as we sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Here now, our benediction for this morning. May the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of the magi, the obedience of Joseph and Mary, and the peace of the Christ child be yours this Christmas. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>